may be. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We'll get going here shortly. So I again will be done right on the dot at 10.15, because I'll run upstairs. As you saw, it's a, a soul man operation today. Both sense of the word soul. Uh, Pastor and Lee are on a nice little fam uh, little couple getaway, so that's good for them. And uh, we'll be happy to have them back next week. So we left off at 1 Peter 2, verse 17. Yes. Can you help us with the math problem with the season? How did we get from 70 to 16? I'm sorry, what? How did we get from 70 days to Easter to 60 days to Easter and 7 days? Yeah, 70 ish. <laughs> Even with the 40 days of Lent, the Sundays don't count. Right? So it's actually 46 from Ash Wednesday to Easter. It would be 40 if you just counted it to Palm Sunday and didn't count Holy Week, but that's not how it's counted either. So yeah, it's it's an ish. Yeah. 70-ish, 60-ish, 50-ish, 40-ish. Uh, the, the Issues Etc. podcast that goes through the, the lectionary even pointed out Lent is just a, an English version of the Latin word for springtime. And it's pretty much just, you know, America and relatively recent that calls it Lent. It was always called the quadragesima, the 40 days. Uh, it's only very recently that we decided to use a word for springtime, especially in Minnesota where it's not spring even once Easter gets here. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the numeric of it. The importance of the 70 obviously comes from the 70 years in Babylon. Uh, and then the 40 is obviously a very big number in Scripture in many different places, most apparently in Jesus' own 40-day temptation, which is the first Sunday in Lent. Uh, so those are the two, the 70 and the 40. Um, those are the two numbers that get the focus. 60 and 50 don't always take that much of a, of a focus other than just, you know, counting it down close, roughly. But the big deal is that you have these three weeks to kind of prepare for the 40-day fast that's about to start. I've heard some call it packing your bags for the journey, right? So the, the benefit of having just kind of a three-week reprieve from the, from the holiday festival of Christmas and Epiphany, which is just... You know, celebration after celebration, Christmas, then Epiphany, then Baptism, then Transfiguration. You know, it's a lot of parties. You need to kind of get your stomach right before fasting, right? You don't go from, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you who were in the military did just pig out and drink a lot before showing up to boot camp the next day. If you did, you probably had some issues. So maybe it was like a week or two before you reported to boot camp, you started doing some extra sit-ups. You got your diet right, focused on your sleep, still said goodbye to everybody the night before shipping out to boot camp, but if, if Lent is the boot camp, we're going to take a couple weeks to just kind of calm down, get focused, maybe start planning for what we're going to do as a discipline during Lent, and uh, then be ready to go once it happens. So thank you for that question, that's good. Anytime you guys have questions on the church here stuff, don't be afraid to uh, ask and bring those up. All right, we can all say hi to the birthday girl in the back of the room. My daughter's first birthday is tomorrow, one year old. Hi, Lena. Paying no attention. I make her sit in the back of the room so she doesn't distract you all from the sacred topic of God's Word. Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants here. Show us now your ways, that we may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Give us life, O Lord, according to your word, and we will declare your greatness. Amen. To review and orient ourselves in 1 Peter, uh, we're in a larger section from earlier in chapter 2 till chapter 4, dealing with the ministry of hope. The opening chapter was more of an exaltation of hope, hope being the key uh, virtue that is taught and given through 1 Peter. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, we got a, a kind of theme verse for the next couple of sections. Uh, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That focus on conduct among the Gentiles 
uh, overarches the next couple sections. So immediately following that last week was obedience to earthly authorities, including the emperor. This week he will address slaves as the second group, in which there is um, service rendered to someone who may or may not be Christian for the purpose of testimony to Christ. Then we will get wives on the same account. So all citizens, then slaves, then wives, then husbands. And then it'll finish off when we get to next week's verses again with another uh, hearkening to all Christians in their calling in life to live in this conduct for the sake of the witness. So that's where we're at. We get examples two, three, and four today of the holiness of obedience as a testimony to Christ and as a praise to God, too. So starting at verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it, is it if... When you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. All right, so a lot like Paul, uh, in that he addresses a Christian vocation and then spends the whole section talking about Christ rather than the vocation, right? Paul in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, and then the next eight verses are all about Christ, not about husbands. That's a, that's a beneficial way to talk. And so here we can look at the words he says about Christ and realize that this, that part of this section does not just apply to household servants, but also to us as citizens and also to the wives and husbands who will be addressed next. Right? Because nothing he says here about Christ is so particular to household servants that all of us can't apply it to ourselves as well. In fact, we can, and that's what we'll see. So first, in verse 18, we do get a different word than when Paul addresses slaves in Ephesians and Colossians. It's quite literally household servants. Uh, household servants obey your masters. Um, and this is important, again, because the bigger section we're in, he has told them they are aliens or foreigners in this world. Last week we worried that Christian citizens would take the fact that they are aliens and strangers in this world to mean they have no earthly government. That they have no earthly allegiance. That that's not the case. And here, too, he is precluding the false deduction that, well, because I am not of this world, I guess my earthly master is not my master either, and I, as a Christian household servant, can disobey whenever I want, especially if he's a bad guy who treats me unjustly. Paul says no. So too with husbands and wives, the fact that you are aliens and strangers in this world does not mean that your marriage vows don't count, or that it's just a state marriage license that doesn't matter. It does. Right? We still are in this world. And these human institutions, as Paul, uh, Peter said last week, these human institutions are good, and we ought to obey them and heed them. All right, verse 19, then, is where he gets into uh, the, the perceived problem, the conflict of what happens, though, when your earthly ruler is unjust. It's easy to obey a good, just, fair Christian master who gives the household servants all day off on Sunday to go to church and be with their families and takes good care of them. It's easy to do that. What about when they are unjust? He says it is a gracious thing to suffer it 
especially if you're mindful of God. Right? And we can, we can apply that to what we looked at last week as well. It wasn't just obeying godly emperors. There weren't any yet at that time. They were pagan emperors, often who persecuted the church. Uh, but submitting to them out of reverence for Christ, mindful of when we are commanded to disobey God, we obey God, but insofar as it is an earthly authority making a claim, maybe unjust, suffer it. Suffer it with a good conscience. So here too, he gives the servants, the household servants, the call to suffer under an unjust master. I think this calls to mind a little bit our parable from last week, the laborers in the vineyard. For whatever, I don't want to get into too big of a, of a sidetrack on slavery in Jesus' time or in Peter and Paul's time, but it was actually better to be a slave than a day laborer. Right? The laborers that we saw last week, if they did not get hired that day, they did not have a day's wage. And every given day, there was complete uncertainty of where your bread was buttered. That is a worse position in their economy than a household servant, slave, who has a consistent agreement with his master. Right? He can't just be put out, and most of their laws of their day too, this, there were repercussions for masters who did not fulfill their end of the bargain. Um, I talked about this in Ephesians, that some of these household slaves or servants in the Greco-Roman world would actually be able to own their own property. Right? If you want to go back to the, the Ephesians study, I talked about this much more. Uh, so it's still on YouTube. They haven't flagged it and taken it down as hate speech. But the, I talked about it more then, what a household slave was actually capable of doing and what they would be comparable to today. Some of them may be even equal to business managers today. If you think about how many people were underneath them that they might be uh, advising, directing, managing. Right? Some of these household managers were managing households that were equal to small businesses. So just to keep the terminology in perspective too. What do you do when you have an unjust, an unjust master? Consider Christ. Right? Be mindful of Christ Jesus. He does point out in verse 20 something that also applies in other vocations besides servanthood. Uh, what good is it to you if you're punished when you sin? That's not righteous, right? If you're guilty of sin and you are punished, that's not enduring suffering for the gospel. Uh, but it's a gracious thing if you're doing good and suffering for it. Right? If you're doing what is right and God-pleasing according to the Ten Commandments and it causes a little suffering from an unjust master or ruler or an unchristian spouse in the next verses, we suffer that. If, you, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So bear that in mind too. Uh, verse 20, suffering. He even uses a very particular powerful word for the apostles. He calls it your calling. Your calling as Christians is to suffer. For doing good, not for doing sin. Verse 21, for this, to this you have been called because, the rationale for this calling, Christ also suffered leaving for you an example. Uh, and with only one exception, this is very important because Christ as an example uh, gets very much abused and mistaught as if Christ is an example always of, you know, your better life now, your moral obedience, etc., etc. There's lots of ways people can take Christ as an example and make it very law-heavy on you. Every time Christ is referred to in the New Testament, except one, as an example, it has to do with his suffering. Every time, let me say that again, I printed it on your sheet. With one exception, when Scripture presents Christ as an example, it is always specifically with reference to his willingness to suffer and die. That one exception is 1 John 2, verse 6, where it is just a... Uh, Jesus is an example in a very general sense. So it doesn't get more specific into any of the other uh, strange ways that Jesus as, a, as an example can get uh, twisted in preaching and teaching and Christian living books and all that kind of stuff. As an example, he is an example of willingness to suffer for others. 
So absorb that. All right, let's keep moving around because I know you, what you really want to get to is Peter's hot take on wives and husbands. After all, Valentine's Day is a week away. Verse 22 uh, is a direct quote of Isaiah 53, verse 9. In fact, that chapter is quoted about four times in these four verses. Uh, if I was bold enough to speculate, I'd say maybe 1 Peter is a sermon on the day that they read Isaiah 53, given how often he quotes it. And maybe the psalm for the day was Psalm 34, because he quotes that a lot in this five-chapter epistle. Or maybe he just knew scripture well enough and quotes it. Either way. So Isaiah 53 is part of the Suffering Servant Song. We hear it every Good Friday. It's a powerful, powerful uh, prophecy about Christ from 750 years beforehand by the prophet Isaiah, uh, the Suffering Servant. So you'll hear a lot of that here in verses 22 to 25. Uh, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And then an explication of that. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then another quote from Isaiah 53, by his wounds you have been healed. And then we might want to go to, turn in your Bible to Ezekiel 34, 11 to 13, because now he's going to mix in Ezekiel with Isaiah 53 with this reference to uh, Christ as the pastor and bishop the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Ezekiel 34. Verses 11 to 13 is in a longer section on God rejecting the, the false shepherds of Israel, the priests and kings who have not done their duty, and promising one shepherd, his shepherd, the good shepherd, who will rule over his people. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. And it goes on from there with this continued metaphor of, of the Lord himself being the shepherd of his people. Uh, so here Peter, again, the first pope, if you're so inclined, uh, is telling us who our actual bishop is. It's not the bishop of Rome. It is Christ himself, is still the shepherd, the pastor, pastor means shepherd, and the bishop, which is just the old English word for overseer, of our souls. Right? So take that into mind. The, the first pope is telling the church who her chief shepherd is. He'll use this language again at the end. Christ is the pastor, the bishop of your souls. We like sheep have strayed, but here we are returned to him. All right, so at the bottom of that front side, before we get to the, the juicy, controversial stuff on the next page, how can we apply this, uh, this biblical teaching on slavery and servanthood? Maybe a, a guiding, leading question. Where does the table of duties in the small catechism place the verses on slaves and masters? Under what heading? Does the table of duties put those verses? Employers and employees. Right? It's about workers, ultimately. Whether they're called slaves or household servants or employees, whether they are called masters, despots, lords, or bosses, or, you know, if you own a professional football franchise, you are called an owner. That's awfully presumptuous, right? Uh, in any of those working relationships, these verses are clearly in view. That we ought not only work when our master's eye is on us, but always diligently. 
even if he's unjust, right? There's a little more free agency in uh, in our careers, right? You can take another job a little more easily than a household servant of their day could, but you could also take a bad professional step, right? If a slave went down to a, a day laborer, he might not have an unjust master, but he might not have the security that he and his family would have had from the household servant relationship that made up so much of their economy. Right? So we don't want to get too hung up on you know, modern objections that you can't trust anything the Bible says because slavery's in the Bible and slavery's evil. Hopefully you know enough to say, okay, that that's a pretty ignorant take on what scripture actually means by slavery. Again, you can go look at my Ephesians Bible study from the summer on a little more on that. Just surface value, it wasn't a race-based slavery. So what is it? And what does it compare to? Any type of socioeconomic employing an employee. We can apply these verses. As many of us who have a job, who have people above us or over us in a working environment, these verses apply. And especially the, the five of these verses that deal with Christ's willingness to suffer for us and calling us to suffer for doing good, that especially applies in our working relationships, but also in all other relationships. Right? Citizens and civil government, parents and children, husbands and wives, that part is definitely uh, supremely applicable in all those. But yeah, think about your own work life that you've got and who or how many people you may have above you. Some of them will be good and gentle, as it says in verse 18. Some of them will be unjust. And how a Christian employee responds to that will testify to them or to the other household servants, the other workers, of what Christians stand for, what they will bear and what they won't bear. Right? If they will bear with injustice and do only that which is good and legal and never like, okay, well, he mouthed off to me so I'm going to steal office supplies from the cabinet because, well, he's a jerk. That's going to testify very badly to Christians, and if you get fired, it's not going to be because of the courage of your convictions, but because you stole. Right? Just to use a modern example of how someone might misbehave under work. So think about that as much as you have real jobs. I don't have a real job. I'm a pastor. I get to preach the word and get to have a living so I don't have to get a real job. Uh, you guys have to apply this much more directly than I do. So, any questions on that? On slaves, household servants, masters, working? Might be one of the things you have to bring up more personal, more uh, individually. I know one of the big ones that people are dealing with, especially in major, major companies that are bigger than the mom and pop shops, is um, the uh, the woke awareness causes. You know, what do you do at the point at which your company is flying a rainbow flag next to the American flag? At what point do you draw the line on pronouns? How do you talk to your bosses about that? How do you talk to your fellow employees about that? There are lots of those types of issues that do pertain to this. Uh, and not all bosses and not all HR departments and not all companies are going to be equally unjust or, or equally pressuring you in that. But that's a great opportunity right now to really think ahead if it hasn't already happened, I'd, I'd be shocked. But to think ahead and say, yeah, how, how far does a Christian, do I as a Christian, stomach this, knowing that I have an unjust boss? At what point are they merely doing it and not imposing it on me? At what point does it cross that line into, uh, you now must participate in the lie? Because right? that's, that's where most of us as Christians would say, okay, if you want to be a liar, if you want to say things that are factually, biologically untrue, I as a Christian cannot participate in untruth. But if you're going to be untrue, you know, I'm going to distinguish myself as someone who is both good, gentle, gracious, respectful, but also dedicated to the truth. But at the point in which you make me participate in the lie, my conscience can't bear that. And here's why. Right? Being able to explain some of that. Uh, not just on truth and error, but on, in the case of gender pronouns and such, 
what that does to the neighbor who is suffering that dysphoria. Right, so it's not just about the truth and lies, the Eighth Commandment, but also gets to the heart of the Fifth Commandment of doing no harm to your neighbor. And if I encourage somebody in self-destructive behavior, I am guilty in that. Right, if I am participating in the continued depression that will follow. I mean, the statistics don't lie on people even after the surgeries having intense depression and suicidal thoughts. If I continue in that, and are made to be a participant of that, I can't do that. Right? I can't participate in the lie, and I can't participate in the continued physical and mental abuse of somebody who needs help, not condoning. Right? They need help, and help is being labeled you know, bigotry and, and all sorts of other things that it's not. And the fact that there are still some hospitals, including I think Johns Hopkins, one of the premier ones in the country, that won't do such surgeries for the ethical and uh, and health reasons, you know, you, apart from your Christian faith, you have logical and scientific reasons for thinking this is, this is supremely questionable and I, I can't participate in that. Uh, to have those discussions with HR departments and with bosses and people is not going to be fun. But to be prepared for them, to go in reasonably, to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel, though, it's important. And if you do get let go, we, we just got a new book in the library, just published, called Durable Trades, Family-Focused Economies That Have Stood the Test of Time. It's a great little book. Um, it's a great, great book on different careers that you can get into that are family-friendly. And not just like you'll be around your family and working near where your family is, but your children might be able to inherit that type of job from you someday. Not many jobs have that anymore. So it goes through a lot of good statistical analysis. It was published after the pandemic started, uh, written mostly before the pandemic, but he does have an opening page saying, hey, what we're seeing in this lockdown does not actually contradict anything I've written. I think it actually highlights the importance of what I've written. So it's up on the, on the uh, ledge. We'll see if there's a mad dash to go grab the book and check it out if anybody's considering a career change. And, wants to get into the different careers. The top three family-centered ones that have endured all the different changes from the Industrial Revolution to the Tech Revolution to multiple different political movements in other countries. Shepherds, farmers, midwives. So girls, if you like delivering babies, there's a lot of money in that. I was shocked when I read through them. I'm thinking, how much in a year? Wow. So yeah, some excellent, excellent uh, resources there. Stay local. I want to keep you here. All right, <laughs> let's flip the page to wives and husbands. Oh, my wife isn't in the hallway looking, so then I can say whatever I want. That was a joke. I'm not going to say whatever I want. I'm going to say what Scripture says. Come on. You guys at 8 o'clock ought to know better. We're going to start with the six verses that have to do with wives, and then we'll get to the one verse about husbands, which also has probably the most uh, trigger warning worthy phrase in it for the women who are hearing these sections. So, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure or chaste conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But, again, it's taking forward the previous verb, let your adorning be, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishability of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Before we get to the notes on this verse, I'll point out the same thing I pointed out in, in Ephesians, on the section on wives and the section on children. Um, when Peter, writing to Ephesus, or Colossae, or Peter, writing to the five churches of Asia, 
has a direct address to a group, it is presumed they are present in the divine service for the reading of that letter. What does that mean? That means in Ephesus and Colossae and the other churches that contain these different admonitions to different uh, groups within society, they're all present together. Husbands and wives and slaves and children, Gentiles and Jews, are in a service together. Paul is addressing them with a direct address. That means they're there. Right? That's just, and that's important in part because even the synagogue of their day excused women and children from the teaching portion. From the teaching portion of the synagogue, right, they would be excused. The only thing that we have in the early church record is that catechumens, right, so converts who were in the process of converting prior to their baptism would be excused before the, our terminology, service of the sacrament. So even they would be present for the, preaching, for the reading of scripture and the teaching of that scripture called the sermon. So that is it. Before we all jump down Peter and Paul's throats for being misogynistic cultural products of their day, recognize what that isn't, right? Women and children are actually present in the divine service for the reading of scripture and the teaching of that word, which was not true in Judaism. So that much is countercultural. Uh, it's also not fair to say that they are completely, completely cultural products of their day because what they do teach from the Gospels and the Epistles about husbands treating their wives, that is countercultural to how Greco-Roman husbands would be allowed to treat their wives. So the New Testament Christians are more protective and more respectful of women than the culture around them. And it doesn't pertain to the ordination of women because there are women priests in most of those pagan religions, dating all the way back to ancient Egypt when Israel was leaving with the Levites becoming male-only priests. So lots of those arguments that get thrown out against Scripture are just totally darkened and ignorant to the way things actually were, both in reference to the Jewish population around them and in reference to the Gentile population around them. They are cultural products of neither. They are scriptural products based on what God's Word teaches about these various and different callings, which are various and different, but as we'll see in verse 7, just like in Galatians and elsewhere, equal with regard to salvation, even though different in their callings here below. All right, now we're ready to get into verse 1. What is the ultimate goal outlined here in this verse? Think back to the verse that we opened with, and maybe even the language of winning from Matthew 18, winning or gaining. What is the ultimate goal that Peter specifies for wives submitting to their husbands? Godly living. No, it's not no. just that they live godly. There's an express uh, goal of their obedience. The conversion of their husbands. It's what we would call evangelism. right? So their conduct is to be submissive so that, that tells you it's a purpose clause, what's the purpose of this submission? So that even if some of your husbands do not obey the word, they might be won. Right? They might be gained through the conduct of their spouses. So, the purpose of good works within a Christian life is not for yourself to earn heaven, but for the benefit of your neighbor, and possibly even the conversion of your neighbor, right? Virtue and good behavior is a testimony. As fruit of faith, it is an excellent testimony. Yes? Should we assume that the marriage then is one of the institutions that was talked about many verses ago? That Every human institution? Yes. Not for the New Testament. They would not see marriage as a human institution. It's a divine institution in the Garden of Eden. So it does, it predates the estate of the church. So the three estates that we see in Scripture, which the Reformation teaches a lot on because they've gotten really messed up, are the state, the family, and the church. In Eden, before the fall into sin, you can make the case that you have the estate of the church because there is the Word of God being given to Adam to teach to his wife and children, 
regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and being fruitful and multiplying. They have the word of God, so there is in some sense church, although it's not church for the forgiveness of sins. And there is the family, right? In the very creation of Adam and Eve, uh, Adam is just the Hebrew word for man, and when God says it's not good that Adam, the man, be alone, I will make for him a helper fit for him, he then, at the end of chapter 2, switches to not words for biological male and female, but the, the actual words for husband and wife. This is not reflected in most of our English translations because our words husband and wife don't sound alike. It was husband and husbandah, then it would be similar. So in Hebrew, it's ish and isha. She shall be called isha, wife, because she was taken from ish. So from, from Genesis 1, Marriage is the institution of God. And Jesus confirms this when they question him about marriage and divorce. He says, have you not heard that from the beginning, he who made them male and female blessed them and said, you know, he recites both from Genesis 1 and from Genesis 2. That the, the lead, he cites the leaving of the father and mother, and he cites the creation of male and female. So, yeah, even Jesus, and therefore all the epistles after him, they assume marriage is a, is a divine institution even though after the fall, who oversees it is the state. So marriage itself belongs within the domain of the state as a legal domain. Whose job is it to punish the derelict husband? Or the, uh, affront, the, the young man who is taking too much umbrage with your daughter? It's the law, right? The father's. And because you wouldn't trust one father with dealing with his own daughter's suitor, you give it to the authorities, the governing authorities. Right? So there's much more to be said, even in the Reformation time, about which estate marriage belongs in, because Rome was treating it as a sacrament, and the Lutherans are saying it's not a sacrament, it's a divine institution, but not a salvific one, and it does belong within, to use the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the left hand, not the kingdom of the right. If it was in the kingdom of the right, you'd have really difficult things with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 about it being good not to marry, and the vocation of Christian chastity and singleness and celibacy, right? All those things are equal within the church, so we don't put marriage in the kingdom of the right hand, even though God created it. God also created the governing authorities, Romans 13. Uh, so does that help out with, with what is marriage really? Right, so the marriage is good because God created marriage, even if you are married to an unbeliever, Presumably, the wife has converted to Christianity after her marriage. Because we do have Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians that uh, we should not be unequally yoked. Right? Believers are not to marry unbelievers. If you are married to one when you convert, this is where Paul says very clearly in 1 Corinthians 7, you don't divorce them on account of it. If they leave you on account of your conversion, you allow them. But you do not divorce them on account of it. Paul echoes Peter here that your whole conduct of living should be in the in the, the serving the purpose of winning them, of gaining them through your conduct, even if they will not obey the words that you're saying. But their conduct, that your conduct, just as an emperor seeing his Christian citizens, might malign them, but it's false. A pagan husband who sees his wife's Christianity ought to, even if he maligns her Christianity, he ought to have nothing to say on the day when Christ returns in judgment. Because right? that's what two, chapter 2, verse 12 set out over these different vocations, that our conduct be so pure that even if they hate us and call us evil names, they will have no other option but to glorify God on the day of his visitation. They may not see it here and now in this life, but on the day of his visitation they will have nothing to do but glorify God at the conduct of his Christians here below. The Christian spouse towards her husband, especially if he's an unbeliever. The Christian husband towards his wife, believer or not. The Christian slave towards his master, Christian or not. Just or, or gentle and good or unjust. Right, that's the, the, the aim here. There is a second purpose too, besides the evangelistic one. Uh, and that is to praise God. Right, this is, if you think back to chapter 2, verse 12, that they will glorify God on the day of his visitation. They will give doxology to God, and that, that undergirds even this section here in chapter 3. It'll be very clear in verse 7 with how husbands relate to their wives, that glorifying God is a major purpose here 
So that even if you're not trying to evangelistically win your spouse who is an unbeliever, even then you have the purpose of glorifying God with your conduct. Uh, so that too is part of what our good deeds do. And you could then, uh, the other question I have on your sheet, how do reverence and chastity work towards winning an unbelieving spouse? You can think of that, right? Especially in modern marriages, which are very troubled. Uh, we see the way the world and, and movies and TV shows depict marriage and depict the, the perpetual struggle for power between husbands and wives. You can see where if there is a dynamic of believer and unbeliever in those caricatures, those fictional portrayals, how bad would that be? You know, praise to God that we don't have that too often and that it is fictitious. It's usually to the extremes. But insofar as it does happen and you see it, it makes you want to weep. Right? To see, a, in, in this case, a, a Christian wife towards her husband being irreverent, being unchaste, which would mean you know, a little bit of a floozy or a loose woman, how would that work towards his, the husband's unbelief? What would he think about Christians if he thought, well, my wife became a Christian, and now, according to these Christians, she's, you know, able to do X, Y, and Z with whomever she wants? That would not be a good testimony. Um, the reverence and chastity thing would be a good thing to look up between now and next week with St. Valentine, the actual story of uh, St. Valentine, and maybe some of the others that we see in uh, in February, even in our Lutheran service book, there's a commemoration for Perpetua and Felicitas, uh, two Christian women who were um, martyred for their faith. Usually it was mostly the men, but in this case, uh, Perpetua was a noble woman, a noble woman Christian, and Felicitas, one of her household servants, were arrested and, and killed for the faith. Uh, I believe in the Colosseum, in like a gladiatorial fashion, stomped to death by beasts on account of their faith. And I believe it was either the husband or the, or the father of one of them that turned them in. So you could, there's actually a pretty good early church record or account of this, of what happened to them and how they prayed while they were in jail. It's worth looking up and reading. Uh, Perpetua and Felicitas. Uh, again, that one is in our Lutheran service book, so you know it's a little more historical than some of the ones that get added every other day of the year. But as we go through Feb you know, February with Valentine's Day next week, think about what Valentine was doing by providing Christian marriages to those who would have otherwise been married forcibly to pagans, and then people like Perpetua and Felicitas who would not compromise their Christian faith even for uh, marriages. So good, good things to learn about is we have a very confused age about sexuality and marriage. Uh, verse 3 and 4 then deals with things that are not external but hidden things. What should mark and distinguish Christian women is not their hair and clothing and jewelry, but their character, their demeanor. This does not forbid wearing certain clothing, hair, or jewelry. We see them throughout Scripture wearing that. As queen Esther was a queen who had to dress up pretty elaborately. Um, but where your adorning is that, right? Where your pride and identity is in the superficial material stuff, that will not be a good testimony, even if your husband is Christian. Uh, but to rather seek after the thing that God finds pleasing, which is hidden in the heart. So that's where it goes from evangelism to doxology, right? What is pleasing to God? That's doxology, that's praise. How do we praise God? How do women praise God in their bodies? Not by external adornings, but by internal adornings. The things that God finds pleasing. A gentle, quiet spirit. He gives the example then of Sarah, the only place in in Genesis that we have Sarah using the word Lord is Genesis 18, 12, which is kind of ironic because she's calling him old. It's when she's not believing the angels appearing and telling them that they will have Isaac a year from now. She says, oh, now that my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? So, yeah, the old man, am I now going to have children? Yes. So, a little irony there. But it is still 
a good, a good place here where we have these examples in Scripture of the saints of old and of New Testament so that we may learn from them, that we should aspire to be more like Sarah or Abraham, particularly in their good behavior, not always in their uh, bad behavior, right? You should, men should emulate David, not in the sin with Bathsheba, but in standing up to Goliath, right? They're, use the rest of Scripture as your key and guide to which parts of these saints of old we should learn from their bad examples and then learn from their good. So that part is what Scripture points us to for examples. For Christ as an example, we see his willingness to suffer and die. Scripture does point us to the other fallen sinners as examples as well. To learn from their failure, to learn from their faith. Right? Hebrews 11, great chapter for that. The last phrase here is an, is an ambiguous one a little bit. Do not fear anything that is frightening or intimidating. Uh, most commentators said, yeah, this is, this is a strange Greek word anyway for frightening, and we're not quite sure what to do with it. It's probably referring back to the women who have unbelieving husbands that they would not be afraid of the threats that might come from a husband who no longer approves their Christianity. And that's where we can think of the, the martyrs like Perpetua and Felicitas, that they should not fear the threatening, the scare tactics, the, as my eighth graders are learning in logic class, the argumentum ad baculum, the appeal to the stick. If you don't do what I tell you, you're going to get beaten up or there's going to be negative consequences. Don't give way to that fear. Live in a reverent fear towards your husbands, a submission, a subjection, so that you might win them, but don't fear the threats. So I think that's probably the best way to take this, is that he's kind of, after giving a, an example that could apply to Sarah having a believing husband, Abraham, he was a believer, now it's reverted back to, you know, wives who may have an unbelieving spouse. Don't fear the threats. Right? God is your ultimate bridegroom in Christ. He will preserve and protect you. If you lose your life, you've gained your soul. So... One final verse, and then we'll have to be done so I can prepare the, the next divine service. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives according to knowledge, is the literal way, or in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And there's where all the 8th grade boys in confirmation in the table of duties start laughing and pointing at the girls in the class who at that age can probably beat them up. <laughs> Different age of maturity. Uh, and that's where I point out it says, husbands, not boys. Right? Women as the weaker vessels, not the girl sitting across from you, young man, who could beat you up right now. And it also points out, what about the weaker vessel? Honor not disparage, honor, not mock, honor, not gloat, right, so as much as we might cringe at the phrase weaker vessel, let's not cut off the nose to spite the face, let's not cut off the predicate to spite the subject, they must honor them, so again, we take this in reference to verses 1 to 6 and all the way back to 2 verse 12, evangelism, if there is an unbelieving spouse, doxology or praise to God if we are married in, in a believer's marriage uh, and through particular conduct. What is that conduct? Understanding and honor. Two things men aren't good at in any capacity, let alone with reference to their wives. In particular, the phrase uh, live according to knowledge. The word knowledge is the exact opposite of the term for ignorance that we've seen twice already in 1 Peter, and we'll see two more times in 2 Peter. If you remember a couple weeks ago, it was the ignorance of your former passions, the ignorance of the flesh. So now you can kind of understand what the knowledge or understanding is. It's the exact opposite of all those ignorant fleshly things, the things we looked at from Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. A husband should not live towards his wife in sensuality, drunkenness, idolatry, slander, all those works of the flesh. God forbid a Christian husband have any of those towards his wife. That's what Peter's saying. Live according to knowledge, not the ignorance that he has twice now condemned. The former ignorance, the way the Gentiles live. All sensuality and sexuality, orgies, drunkenness, reviling. He lists a ton of them in Galatians 5. That's the ignorance of the flesh that these Christians have put aside 
And so a Christian husband ought not live according to those things towards his wife, but according to knowledge. The knowledge that comes through the grace of God in Jesus Christ. The knowledge that is suffering for someone else. That's how Paul puts it in Ephesians 5. I think by having that long explication in, in the section on slaves, that includes husbands here, that they should take Christ as an example of suffering and dying for someone, their wife, their children, anyone with them. In particular, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Uh, weaker in what sense? Well, within a marriage on average, the husband is physically stronger than the wife. Right? It doesn't say all men are stronger than all women, or even all men are stronger than all women on average, but husbands and wives within the marriage. Typically, women, women marry men who are stronger than them. Just some of the natural order of how marriages end up happening. So the husband ought to treat his wife in accord with that, knowing that. On top of the physical aspect, culturally within their day, the women had less legal and social ability to recover from either a tragedy, in the case of a, a spouse dying, or divorce. Right? They had less socioeconomic opportunities, and so as they are in a more precarious position, the husband should be mindful of that. He should never use that as leverage either. Right? But he should be mindful of their position, the wife's position in society, should he not be around, will be weaker than his position socioeconomically if she's not around. Right? So to be mindful of that, it's both in reference to physical strength, maybe even calling to mind that previous phrase about intimidation tactics. Don't use The wife should not fear those, but the man ought not use those either. And then socioeconomically, it's, it's very much the case. Now, as much as this will have a trigger warning on it, it also has a lot of equality language. Live with your wives. Co-heirs, or they are heirs with you, of eternal life. Right? So we get all that out of shape over the comparative language, over weaker. We overlook the fact then that twice in this one verse is equality language. Live with them. They are heirs with you of the grace of God, of life. Um, so, and also with a threat attached to it, so that your prayers may not be hindered. That where a husband is mistreating his wife, who is living in sensuality rather than knowledge, who is taking advantage of her, maybe even threatening her, rather than honoring her, those prayers will not be heard. They are not God-pleasing, because he is not being a God-pleasing husband. Uh, so that is, that is no small threat. Maybe it is to us, because we don't focus, we don't think prayer is as effective as we ought to. Something we can learn to value the, the power of prayer and see and do nothing that would hinder our prayers. They took that, that warning from Peter much more seriously than we did. Right? Whoa, my prayers would be actually hindered by this? I'd better not do it. Right? If you take away the prayers from a first century Christian, that's like threatening to take Wi-Fi away from a 15-year-old. <laughs> Can't lose that. I better shape up. So, Peter's threat there is not just, eh, oh, your prayers might be hindered. <laughs> no, that's a real threat. That's a real warning of consequences for bad conduct. A Christian would take that seriously. A Christian does not want his prayers hindered. He wants his prayers heard. All right, I'm out of time. You have a Luther quote there that you should read as homework. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.